and my classmates and I will be your hosts this month. During our program today, we ask that participants mute themselves in order to minimize distractions during the program. You can find the mute button in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also pin the image of the Audubon book by double clicking that image and setting your screen to presenter mode. Before we dive into today's program, I want to invite you to join some other upcoming programs sponsored by Special Collections and Archives. Next month's page turning will take place on December 4th and our guest speaker will be Jacqueline Scott. She will be sharing her research on John James Audubon's connection to slavery and broader connections between race and birding. As part of the Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World series, on November 16th, literary scholar Susan F. Eagle will give a talk titled Harriet Beecher Stowe, Orr's Island, and Maine Tourism. In addition, on December 3rd, Don Westfall, voting class of 1973, will share his research on the college's acquisition of land in the state of Maine. To find out more about these programs and register to attend online on the Special Collections and Archives News and Events website. Now, I'll give you a sense of what we've learned so far in our art crime course, which focuses on looting, art theft, and repatriation. We've discussed the significance of the public display and vandalism of Confederate monuments, implications of encyclopedic museums, the film Black Panther's portrayal of art crime, the theft of the Benin bronzes, and history behind the Assyrian reliefs located in the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. During the past month, we focused on Audubon and Birds of America. We watched the docudrama American Animals and explored how a copy of the folio ended up at Bowdoin. We're so excited to share some of what we've learned with you. Good afternoon, my name is Luke. In the Art Crime Seminar, we studied the film American Animals, directed by Bart Layton. This film was based on a very important and topical theft that occurred on December 17, 2004, at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, where four college students attempted to pull off a desperate and blunderous heist at the university's library. Their target was Audubon's magnum opus, The Birds of North America. The Elephant Folio, which is a large masterwork of illustrated bird prints in book form, generally has an auction value of several million dollars. The thieves did not manage to successfully transport the folio out of the building during the heist, yet they still managed to steal a number of books in the library's special collection, including Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. The film cuts back and forth between, between interviews with the actual four students or criminals, Warren Lipka, Spencer Reinhardt, Eric Forsk, and Chaz Allen, and the actors playing the four men reenacting the story based on their re recollections given in the interview. The film tells the story accurately from the perspectives of the four students. When the idea of the heist is pitched, it's terrifying, but exciting nonetheless. The viewer follows them through their planning process, most of which comes from watching other heist films. Unlike in other thrilling movies, in American Animals, as the heist day approaches, the viewer is left with an extreme sense of foreboding, a similar feeling that the heisters themselves seem to occupy. On the day of the heist, almost everything that can go wrong does. They don't make it out with the elephant folio, and the neutralization of the innocent, of the innocent librarian is much more personal, difficult, and painful than they had imagined it to be. The feeling of adventure that was once there is now lost, and the viewers, as well as the four boys, are left with a sense of dread and guilt, although Warren still, does, still doesn't seem to feel guilty or regretful for anything other than hurting the librarian. The boys were finally caught when they tried to get the stolen works appraised at an auction house in New York. In the film and in real life, the thieves served seven years in federal prison and the works were returned unharmed. It is said that they may not have been caught if they had not made the blunders they did in trying to auction away the books. In today's days though, it is certainly more likely that the government agencies would be on greater watch for stolen works from universities like these ones. Moving from Transylvania University's library to Bowdoin's, the volume we look at today is one of four that was conceptualized by John James Audubon and printed by Robert Havel. Audubon set out to document all of America's birds at life size with the Birds of America. 
Composed between 1827 and 1838, Bowdoin's four-volume Birds of America comprises 435 hand-colored prints depicting 1,065 life-size birds on enormous double elephant folio size sheets or abnormally large pages, each measuring approximately 26 and a half inches by 39 and a half inches. Audubon captured and sketched the birds depicted while Havel operated the engraving shop which printed the sketches under the incredible elephant folio we see today. Bowdoin's folios are rare because they have four composite prints. Composite prints are prints with more than one species per page. In Bowdoin's copy, one page even has three species. Four composite prints are more than any set in any other college or university. Audubon sought to have these composite prints created in order to unite the work and make it feel more cohesive. He asked Havel, a London engraver, to create 13 of these composite prints. However, only six or seven were made. Audubon took the best three of the seven and reserved them for his collection and two other friends, while the remaining composites made their way into a handful of sets that are going to be sold and distributed when Audubon came back to America. <clears throat> so how did the college obtain their set? After helping a student prepare for an expedition with Audubon, a Bowdoin professor expressed interest in purchasing the Birds of America in 1833, but the college was not able to acquire a set at that time. A set came into the college's possession in 1955 when Roscoe Henderson Hupper, class of 1907, purchased the folios from Kennedy Galleries and donated them to, uh, to Bowdoin in memory of his mother, who convinced him to pursue an education. <clears throat> the history of the college's volumes between the time of their creation in 1833 and its current location at Bowdoin are not completely obvious, with 40 years unaccounted for between their creation to their purchase by Charles F. Southmade in 1876, uh, or sorry, Charles F. Selfmade in 18, uh, 1876. Uh, upon Selfmade's death in 1911, the folios were then bequeathed to his sister, Emily Selfmade, who later donated them to the American Museum of Natural History. Because they had duplicate copies, the museum put one up for sale at the Kennedy Galleries with the stipulation that they'd be used for education. So why is it important to know the history of the ownership? One reason is to uh, assess the credibility of value, whether the folios were really created by Audubon and Havel. Another reason is to track the legitimacy of ownership, whether the fo fo uh, folios were lawfully obtained by previous owners. After suddenly appearing again in 1876, 1876 it brings into question the means by which Southmade purchased the folios. Now, upholding the promise to the American Museum of Natural History about use for education, not only do Bowdoin students and professors have access to our Audubon collection, but it is also available to visitors on campus and with the help of the internet, people across the world as anyone with an internet connection can attend virtual page turnings. This public access provides opportunities for research inside and outside the college, as well as educational and recreational opportunities for the greater public. Now, if you'd like to pin the feed of the book by clicking the three dots in the corner of the book screen and selecting pin, Marika van der Steenhoven and Kat Stefko will turn the page, or if you will, flip the bird, from the Chuck Will's widow to the painted bunting. This month's page features the painted bunting, which Audubon sometimes referred to as the painted finch and the Louisiana warbler. Painted buntings are also known as siete colores in Mexico and nonpareil in Louisiana. They live in the southeastern United States in brushy habitats and migrate to Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean in the winter. However, painted buntings have been observed across the country, including 52 times in Maine. Their diets consist primarily of seeds and insects, but they also eat berries and fruits. Male painted buntings sing and sometimes fight with each other to defend their territory. And now I will play a clip of the painted bunting song. The current painted bunting population is approximately four and a half million and is decreasing due to habitat loss from urbanization and the creation of cropland. Climate change also affects painted buntings. More frequent spring heat waves threaten newly hatched chicks and intense periods of heavy rain, which are becoming more common, flood nests. However, 
warming temperatures have allowed their habitat range to increase. Painted buntings also suffer casualties from glass window collisions, as well as cowbird parasitism, when cowbirds take over painted bunting nests by laying their own eggs in them. During Audubon's era, people would trap painted buntings and keep them as pets, and this practice continues today. So how did Audubon ensure that the birds, like the painted bunting, were depicted in the liveliest possible fashion? Audubon's original pencil and ink drawings were colored with watercolor, pastel, graphite, oil paint, and chalk. To produce his drawings, he drew from models. Audubon fixed birds that he or an assistant had first observed and shot in the field into lifelike positions using wires and pins. With eyes, beak, and legs deteriorating rapidly after death, he was forced to work quickly before his specimens became unusable. From the drawings, Audubon produced paintings which served as the basis for prints developed by master printmakers. Lifelike appearances were important to Audubon who, before working with Havel, hired Scottish engraver William Lazars to produce the first few printing plates. However, Audubon was not satisfied with the quality of the prints, which were compromised when Lazars' colorists went on strike. Audubon then sought out British engraver Robert Havel, an expert in aquatint. Aquatint was used to create greater tonal range on an already etched copper plate. Grains of rosin were applied to the pre-etched plate and bathed with acid, etching a fine set of pitted areas onto the plate. These areas are able to hold ink in varying levels of intensity, allowing shadows to be printed. Havel's use of aquatint expedited the process, requiring colorists to only apply a uniform wash of watercolor without needing to shade. This effect is visible in the deep shadows of the branches closest to the lowermost bird, as well as around the shadows of the green fruits. Audubon chose to represent whole families together in the same print, which is an interesting choice as family structure does not exist for birds in the same way as it does for humans. The various birds on the page refer to different ages and genders of the same species, in this case, the painted bunting. This specific plate includes four males at different stages, those in their first and second years of life who are lightly colored are located towards the bottom of the page. And the two vibrantly colored birds are the fully mature males. One female is also pictured towards the top of the page with a piece of nest material in her beak. Though not in this print, sometimes chicks are also pictured. Audubon attempted to display all versions of the bird in one print for the viewer in order that they might understand the progression of that species without having to read about each stage of life for both genders. Audubon also frequently accompanied the bird species with another species of animal or plant. So last month, a species of snake was included in the print, and this month, the species is a tree from the genus Prunus. And this specific tree is not one that he um, mentions the birds interacting with in the accompanying text, which Connor will explain afterwards. Um, and so one must wonder why he chose to include the tree he did. Another point to notice is that the birds um, cluster on branches in the center of the composition, leaving the four corners of the page um, largely empty. This structured family grouping, the staging of the birds that Joy mentioned earlier, and the lack of habitat context in the print raises the question about where on um, where Audubon's work falls on the spectrum between scientific accuracy and artistic aesthetics. You may have noticed that there is very little text on the page to describe what is going on beyond the species of the bird shown. This is because Audubon published a separate text where he details the birds and their behaviors. At the time that Audubon was printing these folios, an English law decreed that whenever a new book was printed, copy had to be donated to every public library. The color prints were very expensive, so Audubon did not want to have to donate a folio with the accompanying text to every library for free. Instead, he created a separate book with entries titled Ornithological Biography or An Account of the Habits of the Birds of the United States of America about each species as a companion for the prints in the Birds of America as a way of subverting the law while still maintaining his project an action that could be considered a bit of an art crime itself as it deprived the public of access to these beautiful works. A main point of discussion in Audubon's entry on the painted bunting 
is the trade surrounding the bird, of which he writes, quote, few vessels leave the port of New Orleans during the summer months without taking some painted finches. And through this means they are transported probably to all parts of Europe. I have seen them offered for sale in London and Paris. This describes the demand for the colorful bird in Europe where they would be kept as pets. As Talia mentioned earlier, this trade continues today despite being illegal and harmful to the wild population of the bird. In describing the bunting's flashy coloration, Audubon writes that, quote, the young during the first summer are similar in coloring to the female, a relationship exhibited by the female at the top of the print and the most central male, that the next spring, the head of the males only has become of a handsome blue, as can be seen with the rightmost bird, that the spring following, the same bird is modeled more or less with azure, carmine, yellow, and green, and that it requires another return of the warm season before all these colors are perfected and rendered permanent, as we can see in the final two males in the print, when at a single glance you can determine all this at once. Long descriptions of this kind are only fit to be read to the blind. Colors speak for themselves. These descriptions and the language Audubon uses provide a snapshot of the painted bunting in the world of the 1800s and an interesting perspective on the behavior and identification of the species in the early ornithological world. Bringing us back to Crime's connection with John J. Audubon, his prints and elephant folios have been a large target of theft over the past century. I'll give a few examples chronologically so you can get a sense of Audubon's popularity with art thieves. On, June, on a June evening in 1971, two men broke into Union College's library, shattering a window and clambering inside. The duo broke the glass protecting the school's 100 print Audubon folio and made off with it. Ultimately, when the two attempted to sell the folio to a rare books dealer, the FBI were reported and they were caught. In 1981, a 90-pound Birds of America volume was stolen from its glass casing at the public Peabody Institute Library in Massachusetts. Police soon recovered the book, but no arrests were made and the details of return agreements remain undisclosed. In 1989, a volunteer at the Louisiana State Museum stole 60 Audubon prints from the museum's complete set of 435, allegedly carrying them out past the guards. He sold the prints to dealers across the globe who claimed ignorance of their provenance when confronted by police. 59 of 60 prints were accounted for. Most recently in 2016, when the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh decided to re-audit their special collections, they realized that among countless other missing items, 108 of the 155 hand-colored lithographs from John James Audubon's 1851 to 1854 quadrupeds of North America were taken from the collection. As it turns out, the manager of the collection had been stealing from the library for the prior 25 years in order to help sustain his family. So we must wonder, what draws criminals to these pieces? Is it the millions of dollars of worth that thieves are after, or perhaps the thrill and accessibility of the crime as mentioned in American Animals, or perhaps all of the above? It is no secret that the Birds of America copy holds tremendous monetary value. Beyond the bounty of sorts it has over its head, the book offers unprecedented educational and intrinsic value to the college and the community it serves. Whether it's protecting the book from the menacing rays of UV light or ensuring its safety from, say, the sticky hands of four college students, the college uses innovative measures to keep the book in the best physical shape possible for our viewing experience. Threats to library collections from intentional theft or unintentional damage are real. As an institution, however, we feel the benefits of well-meaning researchers outweighs the potential drawbacks of a few who would seek to do harm to our collections. SCNA staff work hard to invite people in to use and interact with materials on an intimate basis while educating people about safe handling and care of collections. The monthly pages, page turnings aren't just for our viewing pleasure. They also are intended to protect the volumes themselves. The bindings of the book must be protected as books are meant to be in motion of sorts. The pages must be turned or the binding will begin to deteriorate. Natural light and UV rays in particular are dangerous for older materials. It would be hazardous if one page were left open for too long, leading to fading of the rich colors, darkening of the pages, and even photochemical reactions causing the paper to be more brittle, damaging the experience of the volumes that Audubon so carefully planned for. People often ask why gloves are not worn when turning the pages of the Audubon volume. 
It is a common belief that the oils on human fingers can damage art, which does hold some merit. When handling books, however, touch sensitivity is of the utmost importance to prevent accidentally ripping the pages. So the potential risk of wearing gloves outweighs the benefits. Of course, librarians and anyone else who handles the volume must wash their hands before touching the pages. We can't tell you about current security measures in place to safeguard treasures like the Audubon volumes, but we can tell you that they increase the likelihood that objects in our campus collections will be available to future generations of polar bears. Thank you to everyone for listening, and we give a huge thank you to Marika van der Steenhoven and, Kate, and Kat Stefko, as well as the rest of the staff at Special Collections and Archives for having us host. We'll now open up to a Q&A led by Sydney. So you can type your questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. So there's a question about uh, if anyone has observed a fingerprint on any page of the book. Um, I think perhaps Sophia might know the answer. If not, then Marika would be the best person to ask. Um, I did not find anything about fingerprints on the pages while I was doing my research. Perhaps Kat and Marika could help fill in. This is Marika jumping in. And out of the pages that we've turned so far, which is what, we're, what plate are we even? <laughs> We're over 50 pages at least. We have not observed any fingerprints. 53. So we're on the 53rd plate of volume one, and we have yet to observe any notable um, notable wear. So no fingerprints on this particular copy so far, or any other sort of um, annotations or markings. Great. And then uh, someone just asked about our process of putting together the presentation. So uh, if anyone, maybe Josh, or if anyone has anything to say about what we did to put this together. Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, so we spent about probably the past two or three weeks, but mostly the past two weeks, really focusing on preparing this presentation. And we sort of began by breaking into what important sections we wanted to have featured and every person would take a section that they were interested in. So for, for example, myself, I took the background and then uh, a bit of the sort of art crime and preservation aspect of it. And then everyone else kind of continued with that, conducted some research with what they were interested in. And here we are today with the final presentation. Uh, and then there's another question about the difficulty of collecting so many birds at the same time at different life stages. So. If Joy, you might want to answer that uh, and talk about how Audubon got all these birds collected. Oh, yeah. So like I mentioned, uh, he usually just observed them in the field and had an assistant uh, basically hunt them down so he could kind of wire them up into the modeling that he wanted to draw. Um, I I don't well, I don't have like a specific answer to that question, but I would imagine that he would it would probably take a while to actually you know get all the birds, and he probably observed them also in life, but just drew from the specific drawing from the model that he created. Yeah, I think that that's probably correct, and the fact that like at some points he had more than one helper. Uh, hunting the birds for him. Um, and then there was one question about any damage sustained from theft at Bowdoin. To clarify, there was no, no one has ever tried to steal a book from Bowdoin. Uh, so that's why we are able to keep it so accessible. And we have lots of precautions in place uh, to prevent any attempts of theft at Bowdoin. So we do a good job of taking care of the book here. Thanks to Marika and Kat and everyone at Special Collections. All right, if there's no other questions, then I'd like to thank everyone for coming to watch our presentation. Uh, we're glad that it seems some of you enjoyed it in the chat. We really appreciate it. We put our hearts into it. Um, and yeah, have a good weekend. Thanks so much. <laughs>